Well, I have the honor, as before readings, to in welcome everybody, and it's such a pleasure because we have some wonderful readers tonight, and we're happy to see you all. Thank you so much for coming. I'm my name is Carol Mankiti, and my husband was Ifani Mankiti, who bought the store, I think, 15 years ago, who really loved the store and had just thought it was this most sacred place and that he felt that poetry was for the world, what's gonna save the world, that poetry is what was gonna bring us all together. So, cause there's poetry here from all over the world. So thank you for coming. And I know you'll enjoy the reading tonight. And thank you Zoomers for coming too. <laughs> We're lucky to have James as our manager, and Maggie is our volunteer helper, and Fiona both have volunteered their, not James, but Fiona and Maggie have volunteered their services, and they want to help, so it's another movie from the school. Hi, um, I'm Naima. I'm just going to be telling you a little bit about the poets who we have here today. So Cheryl Clark Vermeulen, poet and author of They Can Take It Out, published by WordWorks in 2022, and Chapbook's Dead Eye Spring, published by Sidegist Press, and This Paper Lantern, published by Dancing Girl. Her poems, translations, or poetry reviews can be found in Cake Train, The Drunken Boat, Jubilat, Tarpaulin Sky, Third Coast, Two Lines, in the anthology Connecting Lines, New Poetry from Mexico. She teaches at Mass Art, edits poetry for Pangyris, and lives in Boston with her family. Joan Navaya Kane's most recent book is Dark Traffic. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Writers Award, an American Book Award, the United States Artists Creative Vision Award, the Donald Hall Prize, the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, National Artist Fellowship, and fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute, the Rasmussen Foundation, the School for Advanced Research, and Brown Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race in America. A lecturer in the Department of Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts, she also teaches creative writing at Harvard, Tufts, and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Johnny Rambawa is a Ken Kenyan Punjabi Anglo-American multidisciplinary artist and independent scholar. They received a BA from Sarah Lawrence College and live between the US and the UK. Johnny was a Penn Emerging Voices finalist and has received residencies from Millet Arts, Writers House Pittsburgh, and the Worm Farm Institute, among others. With Teo Rivera Dundas, Johnny is a co founding editor of Rivulet, an experimental journal dedicated to investigations of the interstitial. Melissa Studdard is the author of five books, including the poetry collection I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast the poetry chapbook, Like a Bird with a Thousand Wings, and the young adult novel, Six Weeks to Yehida, as well as a forthcoming collection of poems, Dear Selection Committee. Her work has been featured by NPR, PBS, The New York Times, The Guardian, and Houston Matters, and has also appeared in a wide variety of periodicals, such as Poetry, Kenyon Review, Psychology Today, New Ohio Review, Harvard Review, New England Review, and Poets and Writers. So thank you so much for coming, and before we get started, I'm just going to ask everybody to silence your cell phones and enjoy. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's wonderful to read in this uh, mini, uh, mini palace of poetry. It meant so much to me to come here in the late 90s and to be in the presence of this place. And, um, is it okay to take off my mask for the reading? Okay. All right, I'm going to read from They Can Take It Out. And I always try to do a new selection. This first poem is called Call Me a Nicotiano, which is the tobacco plant. Nicotiana 
invested with caterpillar stops blooming at night so the moths don't visit. By day, the hummingbirds eat them. The gloss of daylight comes on strong, relishing. Leave me to my art writing, my margin, hitting on someone out of my league. <clears throat> I guess I do need a little bit of water. Can you? <laughs> I just felt it as soon as I started talking. <clears throat> so the next poems, they are in dialogue with some other artists. Thank you so much, James. Writing, <clears throat> writing with Pina Bausch. Char in their hair, the company comes to dance over, around, and through the conjuries. One prop is damaged, the other fraying. I heard a doctor say immortal cells are cancerous cells. They don't stop dividing. Boulders, soils, silk, pools, cafe, chairs, and tables. The people lug around war, stumbling, they will not speak, and we do not expect it. Blank page, isometric. My will still naive, my proxies here. The gray skin on my body soon to slough off. We can see you now. Familiar experts move in a maze of cooperation as I play tricks of relief. For me, earnestness meets my foolishness and it is a mixed form. So text me if there's dancing. It is a gift to know what the body drums up and to have someone wait for you outside awake. Transit at night. <clears throat> I love like um, public transportation poems. So I, I contribute to that genre, I guess. Transit at night. Creeley, it's not that I can't move along brighter than my words soaked in darkness as there is not one day I don't love synchronicity and crows. In my reading today, Skylar and Spicer are making love. By the morning of the poem, I was eating pastries and wearing my most sparkly pasties by the evening. Last night on the glowworm of the bus, a man pardoned his yawn. Pardon me, he said, as if the entrance was too wide. I felt it extend and forge our fluctuating company, no matter the distances, the snares. Bioluminescence is nothing without the dark. <clears throat> Operate on hope. And I thank Kevin, who I saw was on the Zoom call, who helped did a wonderful editing suggestions with this poem. I remember that clearly. After Anne Hamilton's The Event of a Thread, which was an installation, a full installation, Two things crossing, an event full of multiple crossings, people alone together, instinctually inhabit, approximate, the breathing of the cloth, the weather, tempering sound, the weather, the room cavernous. We share a sense of touch, a song of touch, distance to, the gift of anima, amplitude, the bright awe swinging with the creatures and weavers and writers in their letters, vespers, concordances, in the space, cooing, our eyes roaming to the quadruped seated, a twin happening, a portrait of bodies and livelihoods, this hall, so immense it lets. So that was a little section that's to several different artists that sort of a continues in the rest of the book and other places like a poem to Eva Hess and some other people. I skipped the whole section <clears throat> called Thyroid and Other Matters, which is really a, a long poem in sequence. So I'm reading, <clears throat> I skipped that whole section of the book. This is called Brainchild. I am recording my delights. Museum visitors who flip through a newspaper of garden plant taxonomies, oxblood, blue-eyed, etymologies of scavengers. 
their heads dip below the spread of the broadsheets, prevailing in these small encounters, the sweet symmetry of their hands, tubular prongs, their arms, their legs, I go on trumpeting the fistula. The female reproductive organs resemble Pippi Longstocking. Her bilateral braids, the fallopian tubes, her face then a uterus, so be it. She is the strongest girl in the world, gets compared to Superman, so be it. Her anger is reserved for the unjust and she stands for the new world order. She asks you to call her Pipilota Delicatessa, window shade, macramel mint, Ephraim's daughter's long stocking, lost her mother early. You see the anatomist Gabriel Fallopio name parts of her and me. Pippi says, let's name ourselves. It'll be smooth going. She says reproduction takes many forms. She says that Astrid Lindgren is the woman who made her who also has an asteroid named after her, Asteroid Lindgren, which is a fact. <laughs> um, so some of the next poems are getting into sort of trying to have a kid, which do doesn't ever manifest in this book at all. <laughs> um, and uh, I think in my final revisions of the book, I <clears throat> was thinking a lot about, well, if this doesn't happen, then I am sort of making these books and I'm making these other things and it kind of affirmed um, being an artist in my, <clears throat> in my mind. And so I think that that's why all those poems were um, uh, kind of helping shape the collection in the end. This is called Nest in Me. Doctor says, you have a beautiful uterus. I bet you hear that from all the doctors. <laughs> nope, I say. I like her immediately and expect good aim. <laughs> I give them names, Hunky and Dory, which my friend Miss Wright says, Honky and Dory. One friend wears a red amulet, another hugs a chanting guru. Even the pragmatics say vibes and juju and tell me their dreams, va 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 womb. Implant, my lovelies, stay, implant. <clears throat> um, so there were a lot of downsides in this <laughs> journey. Um, this is another poem, some other poems that address that. It's called Sediment. In the rhythm of my way to the hospital again, a manhole's lifted just as I pass by and someone's head rises out of the ground, practically brushing my legs. Complete with mock wah wah pedal, I spoof a birth, the man smiles. What do I maintain? Back at home in the tub, the hair trap is lodged with crud, phlegm, my longing. I am at longing's feet, at its service. It is no one's fault. What people said to me yesterday, Wow, that's a lot of shots in the bud. You have some gum on your shoe, uh, some pesto on your chin. Never fear, we will get sperm in you. Your fly is open. Your uterine lining is fantastic. Thank you for babysitting. It's been cruel, a bit sacrificial. After blood work, I am their bitch. I come when called for what'll turn out to be another ineffective procedure and the ultrasound guided injection into the gestational sac in my cervix sucked. Who authored the new paper? My power is in stumping their stats. Having dropped my blood, I lounge in one of my favorite haunts just far enough to see creation. Sometimes I would have like um, medical fellows that would call me and like ask me all these questions. And then, you know, they were writing like writing papers and things. And I, and I would try to, okay, could you like send me that paper? <laughs> I'd love to read it. They never, they like, yeah, yeah, no, no. They, they wouldn't really do that. Um, 
but I, I really wanted to sort of see it the whole, like myself is just uh, this tiny fragment of among many other people, you know, that were in those waiting rooms and see how they were sort of discussed and talked about in the, in the, in the research. Okay, so this one has some um, Spanish. I don't think I'll translate in between. I'll just read it. So if it goes over you, that's all right. Just take it in the sound. <clears throat> it's after the song I love called Gracias a la Vida que me ha dado tanto, which is a uh, song by Violeta Parra. And Mercedes Sosa has, has also done a really beautiful rendition of that song. So um, it says after Violeta Parra and Mercedes, Mercedes Sosa. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, que me ha dado los changos, los cangrejos, los multitudes, las hormigas llevando las hojas across the fallen tree trunk, los monos titis until howler monkeys come bounding and army ants atacando otras hormigas, all carve out their space, rocks, shells, waves, flores, frutos, semillas. The weather goes on breeding the day, the geckos smooching. We could kiss for hours, improvise and rain in todo brotando de vida. Words engorged, llenas de cosquillas, pero en nuestros labios las palabras son escasas. We pull roots to cook and eat, leave the machete. Rita from the finca arrives with her child in bright yellow boots, searching for a young rhizome to plant. You fish, wobble on rocks from a wave crest tossing you around. Men neck deep in the sea, each hold a fishing line among diving pelicans. To catch our dinner, I say, mi amor. New friends gift us mackerel and jack. A trip grows in time, a pile of spines. In small pools, the stinging tendrils, each look a verdant hole, una madriguera. I open my mouth to drink the lush syllables sprouting cubiertas en verde. Near the shore, fallen coconuts are bobbing in a rough sea. To describe is to relieve our leaving, declare what was. La palabra es el fruto sonoro del semillero del ebecedario. Um, and in the original song, it's sort of like this, the alphabet is almost like the seed bed. And I just really loved playing with that. I think there's two more. In the summer. Drug dealers are so abundant that I run into one rollerblading, a friend. Good Lord, the summer. A voluminous open house, my pleasures trouble. Left from the God knows what party is the treat of apple pie for breakfast and from the arborist a new tree whose trunk the neighbor gives a shake as if to test its strength against the masters, mostly maples. The aphids go on sucking the linden sap and excrete their honeydew, coating all the cars in its stickiness. Aphids have the sweetest name for their shit. We know some trees will not outlast us. That tree with limbs we easily count is on its way out as if we're in. Within the house, the gifted flowers kind are lush spasms momentarily color locked in cerise, its vase drugged with a sludge that may later stink up the sink. I thought about grace, the kind, and desires as rooms seen from another room. A friend walks in and says, now this would be a great listening room. Of most rooms I say, let this be a trying out room. All right, and this will be the last poem. <clears throat> On a dead end street is the hour. Rumbling delivery trucks are leaving watercolors and coloring books, spirituals bought used, coconut water, other nourishments. Really, they never tell her. She wades through the dim room with the screen, a blanched pool of description and speech. 
her longing for conceiving, still traveling, roving, all hours. It may have its own bardo. The end shifts, moves in and out of her during the 49 days she's already past the flesh eating deities that it takes for the mind to dissolve and become not physical her longing isn't there yet and the children they were in their sufficient dream shapes until they feathered and trailed off into minuscule bits cellular unsexed no chromosomes known with love, you can watch them float, delivering nothing but their own scattering and hope for them to go. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just dropped my phone, which I need. Thank you. Um, I need my phone because I discovered with my 14 year old just a few minutes ago that our printer isn't working. So I'm going to read a new poem um, from my phone. Um, um, I'm called for my namesake, Nabayuk, and along with my children and my ancestors, uh, the communities of King Island, Uwibach, and Korak, Mary's Igloo, are my home. Um, this first poem um, is a new one, as I said, um, it's called Don't Run Out. Real and white as snow, have you forgotten starting over and over? The swan crossing with a dark tide southward to the sound, not too far off. Firework and blast of something hard to reach and harder to escape. I remember how without you, a woman's quarrel that passes into a quarrel with no one. Um, this is a poem um, from Look Black Carbon. It's called um, All Night Long, I Am Narrowing. I tried to pass safely through danger like you, the mate to a shoe hurled by a breaking wave. The sun never fell away, it angled. I conjured a small opening. How a current drags out to sea beyond a place you didn't pass but skirted. Perhaps not a current, but another woman. She tugs the waves under, troubling the surface. How often, who else, and what of? Um. I'll just read some poems from Dark Traffic and then I'll close with another new one. Rookeries. All men knew a secret of the Northern part of an old world, a less perfect idea. For the bicornuate woman, it was an island. Though its birds lose our trust, we might learn their language. After all, we've been taught to read and write, to remove our hands from other work as we watch water twist into rock, to cover our wounds, staying alive light after light. For something I worry. The moon pronounced with, its known, with clarity its known topography. Our letters and lists reconstructed grammars. They replace the ways in which we were grabbed and pushed, then shoved. Set a wife and her children to robe with indefinite orders. Lineal migration on a small scale is not nautical, but conflictual. Of those men, we knew I could never do them any good. In this way, I forget and let the wind river. It gales and tears at my shoulders and wrists. This poem is called Fieldwork. Another day of heat, the strangers continue to wobble across the horizon, bringing drought when instead we should have deluge. I steep snow lichen and water I drew from a lake which has since gone dry. At sea, few understood me, as though I induced a sickness that deafened, then healed. As before, I predict lies to be pushed from the boat time and time again. 
Nevertheless, I expect to get by while their widowers seek refuge with their provident families. Perhaps a storm will pile fish at their doors when the red tide rises. Perhaps they will not follow as we move moon into moon under another sky. Um, this poem's um, title in English is Playhouse. Even so, we may grow at last invisible. I try to let darkness fill the house and fail at this too, of course. Through fulgence and birch, a civil twilight's the most I can muster. Though yes, it could be said that I do mean to write a few things down. Instead, expressed milk in each bloom thumb number for black ash. Into tragedy, he oversimplifies so much. Each meal of borage, nasturtium, lettuce bitter beyond its bolt, the redolent and thick fistfuls. These things to mind intend, inter, rememorate. Neither does he inflict violence, nor did she, one spring, walk three miles south of the seawall on sea ice, which did not break until it was set to give, could go, and was gone. Um, uh, this title, Nunatak, um, in English um, refers to a piece of land that's left over um, when glacial, glacial bodies, when glaciers recede or disappear. Nunatak. In a strait, some things are useful. Others true, she turns to ash, thrust thus, her head thick with arrogance, infection, and futility. It could be how a young wife went, strewn with net-veined willow and mountain avon, trespass and wreckage. She could write about the year she turned to heat and haze to lays, emumarap imarap dunga, of cannula and silver nitrate, of petiolus and akeen about to begin again, of greens as they green, of a man, aged, eschered, of a confined gleam to hereby dissolve and hold for naught the soil, gravel, silt, groaning as the tools of our penultimate glacier, a glacier I might pronounce like grief. One does wish for words to thaw in the mouth, but find instead a tongue, welt, erosional or depositional, raised and visible, rift, into language and grit. This is my second to last poem. Um, it is dark traffic. And the snows buffered the sound of a voice set forth. I thought her lost already that she had gone to neglect the late migration. Before it ceases, the ice collapses easily. There is no day without a symptom. Consolation may turn out to be a guttural practice. After all, the small gesture of sound lodged deep before it glides without warning downward. There is nothing but the wind, a howl and dive where water is thrown over water and sewn into it. A howl and dive of wind, water she found flown over water where once we found ice, where the snow once stuttered the sound of that shouter, shouting for this listener, holding her head in her hands the head in its fine blank way and original um, for water. And also um, a big thanks to Grolier as always. Um, and um, thanks also to the readers tonight. It's really important um, to hear your words and I'm grateful. Um, and this last poem is also new um, and it is called Turning Back. I wish to be closer to my mother, to think of displacement in a different way, to part the bright green new growth of a plant that she has asked me to gather. We never imagined so many years apart. I have no way to make amends. Set adrift, I wanted to stay near the shore of something familiar, but instead I trace the shape of tukayuk, sea lovage, wild celery, with something other than my tongue. I wish for my family to be its own refuge, for the sorrow to become something Icelandic, some place we can travel back to together, if we have to, if we make it through these days. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Um, it's an immense uh, pleasure, and um, I feel transported by your words. And Melissa, I'm very excited to hear you speak as well. Thank you, James and Grolia, for um, inviting us all tonight. Um, I'll be reading um, from my first book, Time Regime, and possibly a new poem. Um, Primavera, one. When a crow's violet shadow angles toward the mesa clutching sediment, others ask sun, their limbs fanning. My hands answer merch, tasting the shape, gladdening drought, as your dream folds in co-eight hours and cascades over the glaciers. I stop, blunted by an unfastened boom, concuss, the symbiosis of enactment and rest, cones of stacked jaggery, materialize until whatever sensation there is in my breast departs. You rush the limit change changing. You rush the limit, river changing river. Soon with cylindrical certainty, I stand and dress for a walk. There is a specially assigned circuit switch clamped inside my hollow. There are measurements logged in delicate pencil, dates of routine maintenance and voltage tests. I haven't seen the water, this archive, but I'm told it's there marking an otherwise featureless region of granite. Two, a thermal turns poplar canopy over bursting from a fissure in the canal wall as we ride in. I feel you twitch out a direction, say plainly, ocean and ocean. Using my hands, dialect scrapes, I own gore, using my hands, sending you the smoke. With me, you say you have felt what it is like to feel as a woman. I wonder what I have done, where a woman lives, glancing at the wall and its machine irradiated and mollusks pocked. It is like machine of care, program touch. Whereas ocean opens crying and ocean, Say, be liquid, be touch, ask. How certain are you that this is speculative, that dreams are not already gathered about you watching? Three. Once a day or more, I quit the shift, stalking the littered breakwater. I am operable. An incremental fog clots my vision and smudges the summons grafted onto my body. The river reflects but does not move. Is this arrival? Is this divestment? Alternatively, I am becoming more and more mineral. I sip from the aqueduct, and when nothing resolves, I turn toward the silver sprawl pixelating our valley. X is hungry, run map vertically. Tilt your wrist to triangulate. Enter the building, sign here, please, and await adjustment. I still haven't figured out kind of what order to read these poems in at all, so if they seem disjointed, um, than they are. <laughs> um, okay, the next poem is In Tenement Stones Called West. The Colossus passes, the same one hundreds of tides ago or on a separate earth yesterday. One whose body begins becomes the borderlands. As time does, in spasms, as kindness is made to dissipate. 
The cloud scrapes its mass against the empty lot. Banking pre-war designs, improbable non-designs. Unable to shift our bodies enough to witness apex, we are enamored into dumbness. Any war, it doesn't matter. It means I do not exist sitting here in the surf, my name witnessing. The cloud rolls over and tows the horror mast of the histories gutted in me and my solubility looking out, draws the earth along with it. The receptacle is an architecture now in its probability. Maybe it was a radio studio or a mosque, a public arts commission. It may be there yet, this time as a riverbed commanding the next snow. The third poem I'm going to read is a long serial poem. Um, it kind of just like keeps going and going. Um, bear with me. Um, this poem is called Bog Farazade Amadi. And these lines are, uh, the epigraph to this poem are lines that my friend Ozzy, um, who this poem is for, wrote to me in a letter. Bog. Seeing a woman on the way to see, as if I have watched that scene so many times, even though I have not. When? When it rains, sounds from the highway carry further, crow-filled firs. Two miles ascending, traffic hits the house through water. I wake in the dark with the ricochet. The sun hasn't risen. I roam to a different room and I light a candle. Something moves beyond the dark passage of the window. The house tall holly bush, catching scent of a storm heading east from the Pacific. Sitting on the floor, I turn my computer on, adjust the remainder of delicate pink cloth over my head. The traditional thing, the respectful thing, the thing I feel I need to do for my WG's Zoom Vogue, her transition into death this morning, finally sung and punctuated by awkward camera angles, internet lag, Char Saib swishing over the holy book, my brother, cousin, and my aunt bleeding some words, rising from their kneeled spot on a cut of red carpet. Two. My lines, the walk to the sea and back, come from thread suturing their names together across the stars. It comes from the hairs and pores puckering against what prickles like gold, pressed tin cauterizing fingertips. I had a question about how far the pioneer's aura stretches, which is a question about suffusion. Against the intimacies smoked out in the awnings of cheap material construction, against the hill and the film of fog, and the moss-draped vision dome, and the cranes reaching toward mountain ice against my cells and their clotting. The border city that drove out the Trans-Pacific revolutionaries, its migrant labor force with sticks dipped in flame and with dogs. Before the migrants, it was the Salish speakers who would not be moved. It was the light stretch. It stretches, her arms tangled in gold and salt, Another clerk's girl descending from the steamship, Kilindini Harbor's back spray. I've been undulating since her passing, my breathing shallow, her son's bulk collapsing and ricocheting down the stairs. To depart the traces, the ruins, to insist our intimacies in this presence. Three. I begin to feel sad for reasons that my dead grandmother might not have felt sad about. No women can facilitate Gurdwara service, perform Simran for a group gathered in a sacred place like this temple on the West London High Street. I wanted to hear the sounds of women carrying my grandmother away on the Sea of Pearls, but she disliked so many women. To be a woman was to win at a game stacked against you already. Your poverty accrued through colonial land divestment 
your tongue's shape around another occupier's language, the deaths of your sisters by your uncle's hands, or the creeping threat of it when the refugees would pass in a caravan, winding a cord around the edges of villages. The game ensured that deliverance was sealed, not by your will, but by the gamblings of your brothers. Gossip. Then you left the fabric of your home to stand in a line in a distant cold country. Pluck, 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 not you. In many ways, my grandmother was entangled in this until she decided to stop leaving her row house in the immigrant zone. Four. The waters and their theories, moving unstuck from our bodies. I see my great uncle, Dadiji's brother, crying. He and his younger brother are the last living of 10, now that my grandmother has died. I owe him a call, but I'm scared. I make prashad, butter, atta, peanut flour, toasted almonds, sugar, and water. I have no jaggery, no ghee, no rose. The wind picks up and I can still hear automobiles carving through the cascades, a gray light moving across a dome of clouds. Back. When it's no longer about traces but presence, a theorist drops a pedal, an unquantifiable steam of torque, of torque and a shovel, the stickiness of things, the matte sound of rust against wet clay against subducted agates. There is the arrival of a stranger and their quiet departure, leaving the body behind. I would call this residue the phenomenology of divining or the squelching dug place not quite long enough for the rabbit corpse to fit comfortably into. Another matte sound in the hovering above where the petal falls. It is chalky with calcium and the unsettling high frequency that wraps itself around only one ear. Where the presence is, where bodies are, a world of habits that put certain objects within their reach. We could call this history and we could call this memory and these histories might surface on the body or even shape how bodies surface. These reaches of memory might be visited upon our bodies, the woman said who has trembled in defiance against the heat. Six. Laughing, slicks over teeth, saliva gripping against winter's entrance. Dewdrop world is the dewdrop world. The poet writes, and yet, and yet. Her name calls me in at dawn, the snow wilting, the broad leaf trees groaning under the weight your story of working to make the place upright in the bitter wind, my heart line forgetting the tearing shrug of holly under earthen waters, the calyx, the shoe, the death I am mourning, or is it her life I am mourning? Or as V says, the death of someone else crashes into one's mourning for one's own death. I don't know, but I know there is something there in sitting, infirm, and the beauty of that failure. Outside, I make cords out of ice and snowfall, the dew tangled frozen into a net. The cords I take and braid across the yard from the rabbit's two foot deep grave to the front door, a world of suspended water, the ash of an ocean coming ashore. The wind is still. Um, I wanted to point out that there are lines from um, Sarah Ahmed in this poem, if you recognize them. Um, so I will just read only one more, and it will be a short poem. <laughs> um, thank you for listening with me. Distro. Close your eyes. Wait. Dear thread, before you read this, close your eyes. Swallow, blue sky of your throat. The body is met by a field, a flip of the sky pop, lavender to claret. 
The body is met by field, marked by the sky, a crater, and water it brings from the west, 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 until you're east. Song is the body, and so deed familiarizes. It waits for sand, thread, those excavations, migrant molecular composites. A cow tongue finds salt in the seam, sends warm air steaming into winter air. Go, wherever you are, rise and go. That's not the full poem, but I'm gonna end it there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. How are y'all tonight? Wonderful. I'm going to set my timer because I'm not good at keeping time on my own. So um, I just want to say in starting that I'm really happy to be here and share this uh, like temple of poetry with you all. And I'm so grateful for the readers and all of you. And I'm especially grateful to Grolier um, for hosting us and also for having excellent taste in poetry because, yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> I got here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I got here early enough to be able to get some advice and I'm coming away with a nice, wonderful stack of books. So I'm excited. Um, okay, so the first poem that I want to read is called Untitled. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's my daughter. <laughs> full, dis full disclosure here. <laughs> Actually, so. Oh, so good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> sorry, I'm very excited. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did. I didn't tell her to say any of this. I promise. Uh, your your twenties in my wallet. Okay. So, anyway. <laughs> um, I did choose this poem though because um, when my daughter really loves a poem, she tapes it up to her bathroom mirror, and uh, I've seen poems go up there over the years, and this is the first poem of mine that has made it onto my daughter's bathroom mirror, which I'm so excited about. So it's called Untitled. My address is nostalgia for things that never happened. I wander in and out of coincidence, dragging a wagon full of unrequited lovers behind me. I visit the infirmary for broken planets and ill poets, where I bandage metaphors and remove stitches from busted couplets. All will be well again, poets restored to their regular neurotic tendencies free to enter emotional and psychological terrain that would make others run panicked from the landslides inside their own minds. A lot of recognition here. <laughs> oh, what we embrace to avoid the life we've been given. Oh, what we embrace to live the life we've been given. Call everything you've ever done untitled. It's the only honest way to create. Generate a disaster in your life to sidestep the true catastrophe of your life. Oh, there is a universe with a bell around its neck, purring outside your bedroom door. Let it in. Oh, I tried to make this about you, but it's about me, me, me. My awful claws, my electric arch, bats and blue jays hunted from trees. I thought I was good, but I never was. I'm coming home with a bleeding angel between my teeth. Open the door to the heart's door. Imperfection is the only muse. And I am her handmaiden. Please love me anyway. Oh, thank Sorry. you. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> So the next poem is called Inside the Beige Brick House, the Beige Rooms, and it's a poem where the title, you know, leads into the beginning of the poem. And um, I, you know, I was thinking about how poets, as poets, we feel like such outsiders. And, um, you know, the only place I ever really felt like I had was among other poets. I always felt like such a weirdo growing up. Um, so this poem is a little bit about that feeling. And it's also... Um, I was thinking about the sort of the work that we do as poets to unearth 
uh, the things that you know you're not supposed to unearth. So inside the beige brick house, the beige rooms and beige shirted people sit beautiful as unbuttered biscuits. Their awful loveliness upon me. They want me drier than wheat and so still no marbles can roll from my head. I want summer flashing the yard red with begonias. I want ladder-backed woodpeckers knocking at the gables and crank myrtle blossoms blown down like hot pink cotton in a storm. I'm embarrassing like that. A walking faux pas no one wants to be seen with at the mall. I know compassion like the arms of a cactus. I know the scent of earth revealing her secrets after a much needed rain. I buried everything they told me to bury. Then I dug it up again. So the next poem is called Planted My Shame in the Backyard. And I was thinking about how, at the time I was thinking about how, how women have to absorb so much of the, the sort of ills of the world. Um, and I just, it just sort of started stacking on me in this pile of images, so. Um, planted my shame in the backyard, planted its bones beneath a blooming magnolia, carried its head past a split of fence, did not ask why the shine of remaining alive, instead walked filthy with my hands full of prayers, delivered their blood to the flask of shadow, planted knuckles and shin bones, shoveled soil over shards of the coffee cup hurled at my face. Buried spatulas and gin bottles and broken lamps, used the flat side of the shovel to pound it all down into the loamy gash, wholly dark as my woman gash, that has swallowed and swallowed to no avail the fevers of this world. Um, okay. I always have to read at least one poem to um, embarrass my boyfriend. So here's a sexy poem about my boyfriend. It's called My Boyfriend's Bodies Covered in Newspaper. My boyfriend's body's covered in newspaper and the headline says, penis shaped subtropical storm Melissa arouses commentary on Twitter. <laughs> and I'm like, I told you. And he's like, Will you still love me when my shoreline starts eroding? Life's never dull when your name's Melissa and your mascot is a huge, erect, disembodied penis hovering over the Atlantic. Which is to say, absolutely, I'll still love you. What surprises me about the body is resilience. Mine has been a shot glass, a punching bag, a cigarette filter, a lie detector, a crash test dummy. Oh, how it opens and opens anyway, whenever passion comes near. So I reign seven days and seven nights inside the penis outline. I whisper the safe word to the ocean in case it's had enough. And when my beloved asks what time I'll be over, I say I'd travel a thousand years for one night of this wonder. So he's the one who actually sent me the article <laughs> about this storm <laughs> and said, this would make a good poem. So there it is. <laughs> um, okay, the next poem is called The Pain is So Resplendent, It Has Babies. And um, I actually, I always wanted to take dance lessons and um, the, I lived in a small town and the lady who taught dance was really mean. So I didn't get to take dance lessons. So I started when I was like, 49 taking dance lessons for the first time and then a little time after that I broke my ribs um, and so I couldn't dance for a while and then when I finally tried to dance again after the broken ribs I wrote this poem. <laughs> the pain is so resplendent it has babies and its babies are so resplendent they have babies. Underage unwed babies having babies. Someone has built their delivery room in my ribs, and without restraint, they come and go, carrying babies, 
that will birth more babies in the parking lot before realizing they are babies. Flamboyant babies refusing the swaddle of pink and blue. They leave the hospital in sequined eating gowns to perform the burlesque of pain. And everyone in the audience has their shirts unbuttoned to nurse the babies they carry everywhere. And the speakers, instead of making sound, make babies. And the curtains open and close on a pulley of pain operated by the babies. And when the magician comes on stage, she saws the pain in half and there are two more pains that saw themselves in half. And now the pain knows how to saw itself in half to make more pain. And there are pain babies everywhere. And there are no rabbits or doves in the hat, just more babies. And when the cocktail waitress comes around, she serves little cups of pain with pain backs and pain on the rocks, pain crudités on leafy green beds of pain. And when I try to leave the show to go home, the MC announces my next set. And I realize it was just me on stage all along, having babies and babies and more babies with no epidurals. I realize it is me who has conceived and mothered and nurtured my pain all along. I think I should take things a little lighter now. <laughs> Um, that's, that was a lot of pain. <laughs> yeah, anybody who's ever tried dancing with broken ribs probably knows. And it was belly dancing too, you know, because <laughs> I was single and the only dance lessons that you could get for a single person were belly dancing lessons. So I was like, sure, sign me up. And actually I ended up loving it. It's very a cultural, wonderful thing. Um, so this next poem is called Modus Operandi. And um, this book is uh, set up like a job application. So this is, you know, part of that in which I'm sort of explaining, um, or the persona, I should say, is explaining, you know, why she is the way she is and how she is. Modus operandi. I put ranch dressing on the Greek salad. I stand in my front yard in the rain and yell, I'm the biggest waterfall in this desert. When people invite me to parties, I say no, then show up anyway. I bring my cat, dress in a graphic t-shirt with an image of another more attractive cat. I tell everyone I've just returned from my honeymoon. And when they ask to see pictures, I show them the cover of the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass. <laughs> I like kissing people I don't know, sending flowers to random addresses and signing the card, eternally yours, God. <laughs> I'm a window cracked in the rain. My name is sitting down and standing back up for no reason. My motto is wings flapping. You should come back to my room if you miss me. I'll be there soon. I'm a thousand miles away on a different bed. I think I'll read um, two more. Um, do I have time or is it? Yeah, okay, great. So the next one is called We Either Will or Will Not. And um, interestingly, <laughs> my publisher said, you know, I felt like this poem made me think of like flamenco or something. And I was actually dancing to flamenco when I wrote this poem. So um, I don't know how she knew. And I'm reading this poem because I think you know, like most of us, we're, we're thinking about our children and how to protect children and the difficulties of the world. So we either will or will not die in this moment, will or will not throw plastic into the ocean, will or will not tango to the rumbling hood of the car and call it leaning, will or will not throw ourselves off the narrow edge of the universe, will or will not write the great American novel, will smoke pot or not, or not, or not, or will wreck the car, will not, will leave all our belongings to a river we drank and peed back into itself, we will, we will stay staple ourselves back into the marrow, we'll dive deep into the hummingbird heart, learn to go faster, we will or will not, 
will we will will we enter the anthropocene half opened catch a space junk falling from each other's mouths stomp 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 it out stomp the laugh from the warbler write letters to the presidents of distant galaxies stay awake in the wind that messed up the dandelion's hair we will we will stomp morning into the sun stomp the sun's face into the basket we carry to gather the eggs we'll paint the eggs will or will not take them to the church down the street for the kids who would otherwise have nothing we will or will not remember the kids will or will not take the eggs, the eggs that are fertilized with the chicken's sorrow, and what will happen to the kids when they eat the chicken's sorrow. We either will or will not notice, will or will not make change. We will, will we not, or will we remark on what it all meant? And the final poem in the collection is called All That's Left. It's starting to feel a little apocalyptic. So. <laughs> Listen, the afternoon will soon fade into affliction and we'll have no choice but to challenge gravity. I've been corralling wind just for this. I wear it like a label and when someone pays me a compliment, I play it back to them. Listen, the earth is burning and all we have left is a plastic Jesus that lived up to its promise to stay intact at any temperature through any catastrophe. If only I could get a message to the owner of this apocalypse, I'd say, go easier on the advertising. No one likes to see zombies in Louboutin before breakfast. Listen, it's just us here now. Give me your hand. Thank you. Helpful to us if you could stack your chairs against the walls, and then if you're interested in buying books, the poets will be signing them. So please take advantage of that and come again. Thank <laughs> you. 